Hello, today we continue our celebration of the 100 year anniversary of Negro League Baseball. And we are so fortunate to be joined today by the esteemed founder of the Center for Negro Baseball League Research. It's Dr. Layton Revell. And Dr. Revell, please uh, join us and tell us what motivated you to start such a wonderful museum. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, this project started about 25 years ago. Uh, I had a very good friend by the name of, of Bill Fireball Beverly, and Bill had played in the Negro Leagues. And over the years, I had gotten to know several former Negro League ball players like Satchel Page, Buck Leonard, Cool Papa Bell. And they had a big reunion in Kansas City. There's a small museum there, and I attended the, re the, the, the reunion. and. Uh, one of the questions I asked when I was first there, they had 258 ball players at the reunion. I, and I asked the director, how many ball players did you have to invite to get this many here? And he told me, well, Dr. Revelle, you got to realize there's less than 275 players still alive. And um, I didn't think a lot about it at the time. I went through the museum and my first question was, well, where are all the artifacts? Where are the bats, the balls, the gloves? Where, where are all the historical pieces in that uh, from the Negro Leagues? And, the comments I got back from people, well, Leighton, you got to realize that stuff doesn't exist anymore. And I got to thinking a little about it quite a bit more, talked to Bill Beverly, talked to Buck a little bit. I knew Buck O'Neill at the time also, and um, was firmly convinced of two things. Number one, there were more ball players still alive than anybody imagined, because the, ne the Negro American League officially went until 1962. And uh, when I started working on this project 25 years ago, some of those guys were in their late 60s and early 70s. Um, in addition to that, I had been in Satchel Page's home, Cool Papa Bell's house, uh, been in quite a few former ball players' homes, and they had they had stuff from their playing days. And I knew there had to be a lot of artifacts out there. Um, uh, tried kind of gathering some support in terms of from the museum and in, in, in Cooperstown. Um, you know, they had a, a, a defined interest in Negro League Baseball, but, you know, they were very honest, Leighton, we don't have the resources to do things. Uh, met with the people at Major League Baseball, um, and they, their response was, well, you know, that's not part of what we do. And long story short, I was complaining about it one evening at dinner, and my, grand, my son said, well, Dad, you've got a lot of friends that are in sports, and that, why don't you do something? And so, a little over 25 years ago, we founded the Center for Negro League Baseball Research. We're a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. We're an interesting organization in that we have no paid employees. Everybody that works on projects for us, they do it give, donating their time. And I've got about 50 people around the country that um, conduct research, that um, are involved in a wide range of projects to, um, number one, gather the history of Negro League Baseball. Secondly, find the former ball players, and then thirdly, um, collect the artifacts and, and um, educate the general population on what Negro League Baseball is all about. That is just fabulous. Well, you know, one question, I salute you first of all. Thank you for all this wonderful work. We cannot let all this great history of such great athletes and people uh, be forgotten. But let me ask you this. Why did you decide to start this in Birmingham? Well, um, I, was, uh, I was a basketball player in college. I grew up in Arcadia, Louisiana, knew nothing about Negro League Baseball. And um, I had written a series of books, and um, I was doing a book signing at the Astrodome. And my, the, the, the book series that I published um, combined education and sports. Um, not everybody is going to be as lucky as you are to have played in the NBA. Not everybody's going to be lucky to play Major League Baseball. Um, but God blessed a lot of people with talent to be able to go to school. And um, I had cut the book, the book series that I did combined education and sports. And I met an old Negro League baseball player there by, by the name of Bill Beverly. And he and I became very, very, very good friends. And it saddened me tremendously when I started trying to research the history of Negro League baseball that there wasn't a lot out there. When I, when I talked about, you know, the former ball players, nobody was really sure how many people were still alive. And 
you know, the good news in the last 25 years since we've been in existence, and I have a co-director at this point in time, Cam Perrin from Los Angeles, California, helps me run the Center for Negro League Baseball Research. We have interviewed 1,658 former Negro League ball players to gather their history. And we've collected a, a vast number of artifacts. We, have a, we partnered with the city of Birmingham about five years ago to build the Negro Southern League Museum. And it's an interesting museum from the perspective that we tell a national story from a local perspective. So we tell the history of, of Negro League baseball and black baseball in America through the eyes of Birmingham, Alabama. We were the largest um, African-American sports museum in the country. We have about 8,500 square feet of exhibit space, and it includes all original artifacts. We've got Satchel Paige's uniform there, Willie Wells's uniform. We have uh, the McAllister Cup, which is the oldest uh, trophy to known to exist in, in Negro League Baseball. We have the oldest contract. We have a tremendous number of artifacts there on display at the museum in Birmingham. And that only represents about 10% of our collection. Um, fortunately, I've been able to surround myself with a number of individuals who were very dedicated in preserving the, the rich history of Negro League Baseball. Um, one of the questions I always get asked is, Leighton, why would you want to build your museum in Birmingham? And um, when, I first, when we first started the project, we knew at some point in time we wanted to have a museum, but um, it wasn't our number one priority. Our number one priority were finding the ball players, getting their his, doing oral histories, finding the artifacts. And I knew if we kept on that, that journey, that we, an opportunity would pre present itself. And got a phone, uh, I, was, I was at a banquet a number of years ago with, uh, on Negro League Baseball. The players in Birmingham, the, the ball players in Birmingham give themselves, used to give themselves a banquet every year to honor themselves. And uh, the mayor was there and he, he and I got to talking and uh, I'm sitting there and uh, he had asked me just very nonchalantly, is that Leighton, if we, if Birmingham were to build a museum, would you help us? And I said, Mayor Langford, we'd be happy to help in any way that we can. Um, and he gets up and he says, you know, folks, I had uh, this real nice speech in that, but he said, I want to talk about something else. I was over here talking with my good friend, Dr. Ravel from, from Dallas, Texas, and I thought, I just met, met the guy. <laughs> and uh, he and I are going to build a museum here in Birmingham. And the question is why? And uh, I think, you know, first of all, you have to take, a, there are several factors that are important for people to understand. Number one, Birmingham, Alabama has the history of the longest running professional black baseball team of all time. Go back to 1919, went all the way through the end of 1962, in, and they played in a number of leagues. They played in the Negro National League, Negro Southern League, they played in the Negro American League, and then they played some independent baseball in the mid 60s. But so number one, do you have a team with great history there in the Birmingham Black Barons? Secondly, Birmingham, Alabama, when we started 25 years ago, had the most living Negro League players of any city in the United States. And mm -hmm. we, they, we had, there were 50 something players alive at one time in, in the Birmingham area. Um, thirdly, you have Rick Woodfield. Rick Woodfield was the home of the Birmingham Barons that played in the Southern League. It was also the home of the Birmingham Black Barons. It's the oldest existing professional baseball park in the United States. It's a living museum today. And then lastly, they had the Birmingham Industrial League. And, you know, one of the things that when people talk about uh, uh, sports in general, they don't want to talk about the big things. They want to talk about Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson, the Kansas City Monarchs, not realizing that they're are a lot of other very important elements in black baseball. To me, the industrial leagues were very important because if you were a young man growing up in that in Birmingham and thought you were a ball player, that was your proving ground. If you could go out there and play with these older gentlemen, didn't matter how young you were, didn't matter how old you were, if you could play ball and you could make the team for American Cast Iron and Pipe or Stockham, which were teams that were just two teams that were back in the in the 20s and 30s they were just as good as any negro league team in the united states um mm -hmm. then you had the opportunity to it was a it was a proving ground then for the guys that retired 
it was a chance for them to play competitive baseball on a regular basis. So if you had to ask me, if you had one spot in the entire United States, where would you put a museum? It'd be Birmingham, Alabama. And God blessed me with the opportunity to work with the city of Birmingham. I've worked now with three mayors. And Birmingham has a rich history in itself. But the thing that impresses me more than anything else about city leadership there today is how they've embraced their history and how they look at preserving their history. We have the Civil Rights Institute there. You have the Freedom Trail that goes through there. And now we have the Negro Southern Lake Museum that we're, we're uh, right next door to Regents Field, which is the new baseball park in downtown Birmingham. That is so excellent. And again, I salute you. And I remember Monty Irving he had a great quote. He said, one of the big tragedies is that the people in the American public don't know the great black players from the first half of the 20th century. I'm sure Monty was also referring to some of the players that you have really uh, popularized that played in the Southern League. You know, it was a very sensational day on October 4th, 1951, when they had three black outfielders in the World Series of the New York Giants, all of them former Negro Leagues players playing against the New York uh, Yankees in that World Series. Of course, you had uh, Hank Thompson there. You had uh, Monty Irvin, who I mentioned, and a young center fielder, this rookie, also from Alabama, named Willie Mays. So, so many great players come from Alabama. That's another reason that is so important to have your museum there. Yes, and we're very fortunate, and it's been it's been remarkable the history that we've uncovered as uh, over the years. You talk about Willie Mays; everybody knows Willie Mays. Um, right. One of the, a th something that very few people probably know is that Willie Mays's father, they called him Cat C A T Cat Mays, mm -hmm. played for the Birmingham Black Barons in the 1920s, and when Willie was in high school, he played for a local team in the Birmingham Industrial League in the same outfield with, with his father. Wow, and, amazing. And you know, you, you, the, the, there is such a rich history that we have and we're very fortunate today, we have a lot of researchers around the country that are diligently working to identify the careers of former ball players, to recognize the players that are still alive today, to collect the history and, um, you know, we, we've made some tremendous strides in the, over the last 25 years. That is fabulous. And, you know, we have a player here in the Atlanta area that just passed a few years ago. You probably got a chance to know him, James Red Moore, who attended Booker T. Washington High School, played for the Atlanta Black Crackers, and recently donated his glove before he passed to the museum in Kansas City. But he played for the Chattanooga Choo Choo's, and he played for a lot of different teams. Yeah, I, I had, I had, um, I knew Red for a, a good number of years. The, the blessing, one of the biggest blessings that I have had is I go back 25, 30 years of knowing ball players. So there were a lot of players that have passed and passed in, in recent years that I had the pleasure of knowing on a, on a first name basis and visiting with them in their homes. And Red Moore was an outstanding ball player. And he played in the Negro National League, played in the Negro American League, and he also played in the Negro Southern League. And that's one of the things that people, when people don't realize is when they hear Negro Southern League, they're not quite sure what that was or what that is. And the, uh, it's important to go back to, when you go back to the 20s and 30s and even into the 40s is, a lot of most, most, a lot of baseball was, baseball was played all over the country to, to start with. Every small town in America had a black baseball team. Uh, you, you can go to Goshen, North Carolina, which had a population of less than 200 people. They had one of the best black baseball teams in, in the North Carolina area. They were, and, and the interesting part was the, uh, the starting lineup, or the starting lineup, eight of them were brothers. And one of them, Tom Alston, went on to play for the, was the first African-American ball player to play with the St. Louis Cardinals. So it's important to note that baseball was everywhere. Now on a major level, baseball was primarily in the, no, in the North and the East. You had, you started with the Eastern Colored League, Negro National League, and then the Negro American League came on. 
where the Negro Southern League is so important is that was the highest level of baseball that was played in the South. You had the Birmingham Black Barons. You had, you had Chattanooga had a team. The Memphis Red Sox had a team. You had, um, you had every, every major city in the South would have a team that would play at one time or another in the Negro Southern League. And that we saw true. a lot of great ball players, including Satchel Paige, that passed through those doors. Yeah. Absolutely. What a wonderful history. And thank you so much for this museum that you've started and all the wonderful research. And thank you for sharing some time with us and your knowledge well, with our audience. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I do want to say a special uh, thanks for uh, Sonia Smith, for instance. She's the, she's the project manager for the museum. There's a lot of people in the trenches doing hard work every day. And we, 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 I have the easy job. I get to talk to the ball players. I get to find the artifacts. And they have the tough job that her, Sonia and her staff at the museum of running it on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we have, Cam Perrin and I have been very blessed for the association that we've had with the city of Birmingham. It's just been, it's just been wonderful. Thank you very much. And thanks once again for all of these great memories as we celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the Negro Leagues in America.